irrespective of how many sockets you have in your house, they never all seem to be in the right place for what you want to use them for. So today I'm going to show you how to add a spur socket. That's a new socket coming off of an existing. So the problem that I'm going to solve today is that in my hallway there's this really nice alcove that's just crying out for a side table and a lamp on it. So I haven't quite got the side table yet but since we've moved in I've been using my mixer touring case just to be able to put a lamp on. But the problem I have is there is no 240 volt socket anywhere near it. So I've been running a temporary extension lead under the door and round into the socket in the living room, which is really naff and time that I sorted it out. So today's little project is to install a new 240 volt socket, the other side of the wall from where it currently is. So I can one day get rid of that touring case, put a nice table there and put a lamp on it. Now the first thing I need to do is work out what type of wall this is. When I knock on it, it sounds fairly hollow, but I'll only really find out once I take that socket out. So the first thing I need to do is to turn off the electricity and open that socket. I start by using my normal routine of plugging in my socket tester that has an audible tone and then turning off the correct breaker in the consumer unit, which I know I've got because the tester stops making a noise. Then once the socket is off, I double check with my electrical neon screwdriver, which although every electrician wants to tell me is a highly dangerous tool, I still can't find any details of any accidents that have been caused by these. And all the big DIY shops are still selling them, which I don't think would happen if they were being sued regularly. So I've taken off the socket and I've just taped up with insulation tape, the earth, the neutral, and the live. Not because I'm worried about getting a shock, because this is all isolated anyway, but if any of these touch each other there's a very good chance that the RCD in the consumer unit will trip out, which means that the electricity of the whole house will be cut, including the fridge and the freezer, which I don't really want. So it's easiest just to tape these up so while I'm working around it they don't accidentally touch each other and trip that out. So now the socket is off, what I'm very interested to see is that the back box is actually a galvanized back box that's been plastered in. I must admit, because I thought this wall was hollow, and this is an internal wall, I thought this was a stud partition with plasterboard either side and timber in the middle. But it's obviously not, because this has been plastered in, and this is a galvanized back box. I know that this is gonna be blockwork wall here with plasterboard on either side that's been stuck on. It's what we call dot and dab wall. So that changes a couple of things. Firstly, rather than just pushing the cable through this void here to meet the plasterboard the other side, I'm now going to have to drill a hole through this masonry for the cable to go through. But mainly it means that the back box I fixed to the other side of the wall, rather than it being a lightweight plastic one that just clips to the plasterboard, I'm going to have to replicate this and fix a galvanised one that's going to be recessed into the block work, which means a little bit more drilling and maybe a bit of work with a chisel to get that fixed in. Then I have to plaster it in and fix it in place and make good around the perimeter. So a little bit more work there, but it is what it is. So I think, I'll, first of all, I need to take out one of these knockout panels and drill a hole through this wall. All galvanised metal back boxes have small knockout plugs in the back and the sides, one of which needs to be removed before I can drill this hole. I'm using my trusty damaged screwdriver for this, which comes in handy for so many jobs. If you don't have a damaged screwdriver, then just use a normal one and it will be damaged soon enough. I choose a drill bit slightly wider than the twin and earth cable that I'm using, which just happens to be an SDS drill bit, but can still be used in standard drills if you chuck them right. I knock out a suitable plug in the new back box so I can line it up with the hole that I've just drilled and using a spirit level to make sure it's level, I simply mark around the perimeter so I know where to drill.
I'm using a 35mm deep box for this, so I put some tape on the drill at 40mm to help me control the depth of hole. What I didn't know at this point is that this drill bit is actually banana shaped. As soon as I started drilling, I thought I hadn't put it in the chuck properly, so I tried again just to realise that it just isn't straight. So after throwing that in the bin, I moved on to a new 6mm bit, which I know is definitely straight. I'm aiming here to drill at the centre of the line, so I'll end up with a hole a few millimetres bigger than the box all the way around, which gives me some room to adjust it within the hole. This type of drilling is called stitch drilling, where essentially the holes start meeting up, forming a channel rather than just individual holes. Because the brickwork seems quite soft, I use a small cold chisel I've had for some time, but I've never had an occasion to use. It wasn't long before I had the majority of the material out and I could tidy up the sides and the corners. So that was pretty straightforward, mainly because the blocks that this wall is made up of are so lightweight, they're like honeycomb, they break really easily and drill even easier. Now this, if this was a plasterboard wall, if this was a stud wall, I would have cut that hole using what's called a jab saw, and it looks a bit like this. If you put a couple of holes in each corner, you can actually saw the plasterboard in quite a nice line, and get quite a nice finish with just a, a hand saw. Now my next job is to install the galvanised back box into this hole that I've just made. And you'll notice that they give you some screw holes here that you can actually screw it into the hole. And I'd highly advise not doing that at this time. You see the, the back of the hole that I've just made is rough to say the least. And if you're going to screw that in, this is going to end up at all different types of angles and definitely not in the right place in and out. So what I like to do is to essentially glue these in place and you can use different materials to do that. Plaster is a really good medium to plaster the back and then stick it in. You can also use construction adhesive. What I'm using today is this plaster filler which is a bit like plaster. I'm going to put two large blobs on the back and then squidge this into the hole and that means that I can level it and get it into the right position and backwards and forwards quite precisely before filling around the outside and letting all that go off. Only once that's got some strength will I then drill some holes here and fix with some screws. So, time to get a bit messy. To ensure the plaster or adhesive sticks to the blocks in the back of the hole, it's important to first remove any dust or debris. I also take the opportunity just to trim any ragged edges of the exposed plasterboard at this point. I ended up putting three large blobs of filler on the back of the box. It doesn't really matter how many, as long as you keep clear of the knockout hole so you don't have to re-drill it. With the box squished into place, I can start adding filler around the perimeter. Gradually, the more you put in, the tighter everything gets, although you do still have the ability to adjust its position. The excess filler can be removed and then I use my filling knife just to finish off any gaps the best I can.
I left this overnight to cure and now it's absolutely solid and stuck in there. That's never ever going to come out. I was going to put a couple of screws in the back, but I don't think I'll bother because the only way that's ever going to come out is if someone drills around it to rip it out. I must admit, I did come back to it a couple of hours after I stuck it in just to tidy up around this edge. You see, with a big crack, you can't always fill it in one shot. Sometimes it's better to leave it slightly recessed and then come back to it after a couple of hours once it's got the initial set and just add to it and just tidy it up around the edge. This is still a little bit rough, so I need to do a little bit of sanding and then I'm going to paint it. I've got a big tub of paint and a very small paintbrush. However, having said that, most of this you'll never see because the first five or seven millimetres all the way round is going to be covered by the electrical socket. So most of that you'll never ever see. The other little job I've got to do is I need to fit one of these electrical grommets in the hole, the knockout panel at the back. You see with the cable go through the knockout panel, you've got a rough edge there and it's good practice to put one of these rubber grommets on so the cable can never get damaged. Now that would have been a lot easier for me to do when this back box was out before I put it in, but I forgot about it. So I now have to put that in. There's nothing like a challenge, is there? I also need to do the same for the other side where I've got the original back box that I knocked out the knockout panel and uh, get one of these in, so just to make the job complete. So I'm going to rub that down, paint that. While that's drying, which is only going to be 10 or 15 minutes, I'm going to go around to the other side, install the socket and then come back and finish off. I'm using 2.5 millimeter twin and earth here to match the wiring for the rest of the ring circuit and to make sure I've got the capacity to be able to plug in two 13 amp appliances. The socket I'm using here is the new MK Logic Plus Rapid Fix, which uses clips rather than screws to clamp onto the wires. So I prepare the existing wires by straightening them and trimming them to length. The great thing about this new type of socket from MK is that each wire has its own connector, so I can be sure that I still have continuity around the ring circuit, which is important, while not having to try to fight to get three wires into one hole successfully. The rules are that only one spur socket is allowed to be connected to an existing socket. So if you want to run more than that from a single socket, you can, but you'll need to add some protection to the new circuit in the form of a fuse connection unit. With the existing cables connected, I cover the bare earth lead and connect in my short length of new cable that goes to the new socket. With that side of the wall complete, I moved on to doing the same on the other socket, although with only three wires, it's a lot easier to handle.
With the electricity switched back on, I can test both sockets with the socket tester and the job is done. Simple pleasures. Don't you just love it when a plan comes together? Although this thing I think is probably going to stay here longer than I had first suspected. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please check out the other ones on my channel and please subscribe. And if you have subscribed, don't forget to hit that notification button, which means you won't miss any future videos. So until next time, I think I'm just going to sit here and play with this. Eh?